Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Our topic today is exploring Indigenous art and symbols of health and wellness. My name is BC Echohawk and I'm a member of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. On behalf of the Native Connections team and contracting officer representatives Maureen Madison and Jan Dunbar Cooper, thank you all for joining us. We have an interesting topic we'll be discussing today, so we hope you'll share your thoughts and not hesitate to comment. You can use the raise hand function and we'll call on you to unmute your microphone and comment. Feel free to enter questions or comments in the chat box anytime during the session. Right now, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Pearson, who will introduce our guests to open us up in a good way. Thank you, BC. Welcome, everyone. My name is Sarah Pearson, Native Connections and Tribal Action Plan subject matter expert. With the spirit of the arts and youth in mind, we have a special guest joining us today, all the way from southeastern corner of the Navajo Nation near Window Rock, specifically Fort Defiance. Traditional healer Travis Teller is here to offer a few words of, to help open us up. Travis, you have the floor. I think Travis just joined us, so he might be just coming online. In case Travis can't come online, would anyone else like to open us up for this webinar? I don't hear any takers, Julie. What do you think? Oh, Travis is trying to connect now. Travis will give you another moment. Uh, uh, we'll also look for a backup for you. And while we're waiting for Travis, just to, to mention that we put in the chat, if you could just share, um, share where you're from, your name and location. Good morning, folks. Alaska time. Uh, my name is Asi. I live in Anchorage. I am. I was born in Bethel, but I grew up in the village of Chaponic, Guyana. Thank you, Asi. Well, also, while, while we're waiting for Travis, I'll just uh, share that our webinar today on exploring Indigenous art and symbols of health and wellness brings us a panel of young and established Native artists and a panel of leaders from major museums of native arts. They're coming together with you to discuss the connection between indigenous art and symbols and a native person's health and sense of wellness. This is a special webinar and to allow for a healthy exchange of ideas, resources, questions, and wisdom, we expect to go about 90 minutes. Travis, are you with us right now? Uh yeah, this is Mark. I think he's not in the meeting at this second. <laughs> All the way from Navajo Nation. Travis, we were waiting for you. Hey. Is there anyone that would be willing to um, to open us up in a good way? To share something that just to put us in a good frame of mind as we talk about this uh, wonderful topic of Indigenous art and symbols of wellness. I could I do would so. Like to, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Asi. Asi, okay. go ahead. All right, Asi, thank you. I would like to use a some of the words like in Yupik, the term Kukuluta is a term that we use told by our elders and um, sort of our ancestors. The term Kukuluta is we support one another, we encourage one another on a good in a good way in a good path so the the that's what i um calls for the, that's what i think needs to be more stressed in that regard because it's important not just for this conference but for also you know society at large and to always keep that in mind is to is to to encourage one another and support one another in a good way 
Oh, nice. Wonderful. Thank you, Asi. Well, let's move forward, Mark. So if, yes, we, uh, we'll get to the panel in just a moment, but first, polling questions. We wanna hear from you. Um, so get ready to use the chat box, or if you want to come uh, get unmuted, let us know. But we've got some questions for you. We'd like to get uh, into where your hearts and minds are regarding the arts and crafts. Let's start with the first question. What indigenous arts or crafts do you use in your Native Connections program? Let's hear what people have to say. Julie, what do you think they're using? Okay, well, I'd like to hear from our, our uh, folks that have joined us on this webinar um, to either put it in the chat or come off mute. And we have Jackie Lloyd Brand Randolphy, who says beading, beadwork, always a wonderful traditional craft. And we'll have, we've got some bead workers that are going to be presenting some of their, their, uh, their, their creativity. Anyone else? Oh, Kimber Kimberly says, I teach anything I know how to make. So popular workshops are like ribbon skirts and shirts. Oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful yeah. work. And sewing, making ribbon skirts. Another person, Tina Jackson. Jocelyn says, basket weaving. That's great. And we're going to have a, a little discussion about Apache uh, burden basket weaving a little bit later. Kimberly mentions beading. Melody mentions drum making, traditional plants. Oh, wonderful. And beading. Beading's popular today. Uh, mural arts, anime, Neguest, thank you. Um, and uh, Jackie says, looking into moccasin making. Steve Hendricks says, we're looking into basket weaving with an elder. Wow. You're going to, you're glad you came to this event, Steve. Anybody else? Oh, Mar Mario says cultural dances. Very nice. Oh, those are some wonderful responses. And beading, Adrian mentioned beading. So it's it's great. I love beadwork. It's our uh, our luxurious uh, uh, apparel. I love beadwork. And did we have another comment here? Regalia making. Regalia, yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah. Oh, Brandy says bead, cedar weaving. Nice. Ribbon skirt, storytelling. Canoe pulling, oh, that's wonderful. And Swinomish culture, very nice, Brandy. Thank you. Oh, thank you for sharing. Well, let's take a look at our next question. And this is a good one. Who do you reach out for support with this activity? How do you get your uh, traditional arts and to, to be able to be shared with your Native Connections program? You can add it in the chat or come off mute and share. We've had some wonderful things. Grants. I like that one, Grants. That's a, that's a popular, that's popular. Elders. Thank you, Melanie. Jocelyn says local elders too. Excellent. Marcus says recognizing local leaders in the field. Very good. Brandy suggests elders and knowledge keepers. Excellent. And I, I wonder how they reach out. How do they find these people? I guess just through reach out, outreach and asking around community partners. Thank you, Matthew. Mm. Local schools, local universities, and urban native health centers. Wow, Shakota, thank you. Tina says outreach, word of mouth, youth, and families. Thank you. Oh, how true is that? Word of mouth. Sometimes we find that Indian country is small. We have connections, and that's what we do when we get together is we find out, who do you know? And usually we uh, know somebody. Who knows somebody? Oh, great. Awesome. It's good, be, it's good to be connected, isn't it? Now, we are talking about native connections, right? So the next question we have for you is what, what, if any, challenges, we don't have challenges, do we, Julie? What, if any, challenges stand in the way of providing Indigenous arts and crafts instruction to youth? If you have any challenges, what challenges stand in the way of providing Indigenous arts and crafts instruction to youth? What are they saying, Julie? Julie? Let's see what we have in the chat. I think oh, uh, Kim mentioned from the last uh, question, we publicize our workshops in local media. And if I'm asking for help or support, I ask my teachers. So yes, we've got those good teachers in our communities that we can go to. Um, anyone else? Challenges? 
sometimes I hear that, you know, when you're running programs, it can be a challenge for difficult for uh, transportation. Oh, and Jackie Lloyd ran Jackie Lloyd says many time many projects take multiple sessions and hard to get used to come to every session right yes. Um, Kim Viju says funding always a concern to get the money to be able to present information time and space Marcus, thank you for that and Melanie Stevens says sometimes the youth are more involved in sports and do not want to learn and. It was we know when we have youth in sports there's competing activities there's only so much time kim says challenges lack of youth response families who are intent on pitting and splitting people oh that is a challenge sometimes in our communities yep to keep that positive inertia going uh food budget is a challenge Callie. i i i, I hear you that has been a challenge on how to be able to provide food we know in our Native Connections programs, that's something that, you know, the grant funds aren't aren't used for. But um, as Native uh, communities, usually we find a way to get some food there. But I hear you. Marcus said transportation. Boy, isn't that the truth? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. And oh, and Mario Fernandez, he's pointing this. Are you talking about food budget? The one that uh, <laughs> yeah. Callie mentioned? I think yeah, so. food and transportation. Yes. We live in a pretty rural area. Wow. Yeah, that would be a challenge. Sorry, I'm also snacking right now, so I didn't want to <laughs> I'm off of <laughs> mute. Back yet. away, Mario. We're just so <laughs> happy you're here. And Adrian says, I believe maybe kids do want to learn, but sports is a big thing coming from a youth. Yeah, that's true. I wonder if we can mingle sports and 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 arts. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. And, and a lot of youth that are talented are multi-talented, so they may be athletes as well as being artists, like Adrian. And sport is art from Marcus. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right, we got some good sharing here. I appreciate that. All right. Well, you know, um, Callie says it's been hard to recruit at schools that do not already have an established Indian ed program. Oh, okay, so getting access to the participants and being able to recruit them to come to the programs. That community engagement and making those partnerships is always important. Thank you very much for that. Okay, well, um, why don't we move into our next, uh, next uh, part? So I also wanted to mention too, when I talk about, um, talking about these uh, guiding questions, you know, when we were talking about doing this webinar, Oh, let me introduce myself first. My name is Julie White Pigeon, Minisiku Indigenous. Nekizito dem, Sagana Chippewa Potawatomi, Odawa Anishinaabe Kwendao. I'm um, Julie White Pigeon. I'm a GTA, Grantee Technical Assistant, and I work with grantees in California and Wisconsin. And I'm a, um, a member of Saginaw Chippewa Tribe. Live in Michigan, Hastings, and I've been with Tribal Tech for about three years. I'm also a powwow dancer, and I really enjoy learning traditional teachings. But this webinar just spoke to me because you know, we're talking about integrating Indigenous art into our Native Connections programs. And so when I think of art, I think of our um, cultural and spiritual well-being, because we talk about our four aspects of human nature, the mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual. And Indigenous art blends all those aspects of human nature and creativity and expression of a good life. And an elder once told me that when we're not busy working or playing, we are creating, we're dancing, we're praying, and it all makes up a good life, the Madzuman. So helping our youth find that good life is what drives the activities of our Native Connections programs. So that's why we're here. We're bringing our artists and subject matter experts to discuss aspects of art and explore how it has always helped our people on a healing journey. So let me move over here to our guiding questions. Now, these are going to be some of them addressed by our uh, subject matter experts and our, and our artist panel. But we're gonna talk about what did health and wellness look like traditionally among some tribes? And what does a healthy life look like? We're gonna talk with our artists about how do the arts support a sense of connectedness or interconnection? How can youth programs reintroduce traditional arts and crafts to youth today? Talk about some examples and resources. And then we're gonna to get to look at some examples of indigenous art and symbols being created today. So at this point, I'd like to uh, look at our um, artist panel. We're going to be moving into Looking at, we've got a lineup of four individuals, some talented folks. Three of them are here in person, and then we have a video that we're going to be able to share. And um, so I'm going to call on our first um, person that we're going to be that's going to be sharing our artist. This is Asi, Asi, and I wanted to mention too. Um, 
is he is Yupik, and uh, some of the the language is a little bit different than our um, the language that I grew up with. And um, so I, I apologize if I mispronounce things, but I'm going to do my best to be able to introduce the special things that you bring. So Asi Kaya Kayok is a Yupik artist. And uh, he was born in Bethel and grew up in Chifornak. He's Yupik Inuit. And he has his bachelor's in arts and sculpture from the University of Alaska Fairbanks in 1991. He's a Pamiyu a member, a traditional drum leader, a traditional composer, choreographer, choreographer, drum maker. He's a mask and ivory carver. And I liked what he said about redeveloping our connectedness of ancestry through the arts is integral, a part of our holistic view for the full development of as human beings and of our place in this divine creation known as earth. Asi, let me turn this over to you. Thank you very much. Kuyana. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I'm grateful to be here on this day. Um, I, uh, my parents are Maria Naikok Gairayok and uh, my father Hilary Gairayok. Um, with my work as an artist, um, knowing our ancestral stories gives us a platform, a sense of connection, and adding that rich traditional history with the world we live in as of now, instead of feeling extinct, which our colonizers try to give our youth um, of that feeling through, through their educational messaging that our peoples are not alive anymore. In traditional dancing within and outside of school life, we maintain that we must maintain that relationship through traditional harvest activities and exercising those traditional values of sharing. And this is just specific to our area. Within the educational system, you know, the, um, we could begin to pl plug in those voids, many voids uh, through our, our that are Yupik new into songs like old stories, like the boy who went to live with the seals, um, um, and share it as a platform. The school district where I come from, the Lower Kasukum School District, now hosts a annual traditional dance festival and, and encourages other communities who stop dancing to, to restart their traditional dances. With my work over the years, um, in recently, um, there's, there's three regions in our Yupik region. There's the Bristol Bay, which is the uh, the, which is home to the Southwest, Southwest Region School District. The Kasukum has two, the Lower Kasukum School District and the Kaspak School District. And then the, the, the Yukon River Region, which is the Lower Yukon School District. My vision with this work of redeveloping this work is to allow each of our um, region to come together, what I call the Yupik Hoedown, in a large enough place like the Alaska Airlines Sports Center in Anch here in Anchorage, um, we get to tell our story of our ancestry through apparel. And each region had their own specific um, design apparel and they can um, showcase who they are, where they come from, and with the value symbolizing to each design of what they stand on as a platform. And when appropriate, use specific matrilineal and marks for females um, when appropriate. And um, all of this, I find, is for you know a holistic wellness that creates the safety net. Um, with the subject of suicide, I had personally experienced my nephew committing that. A very dear friend of mine. Uh, his grandson committed suicide too as well um, for losing hope. And um, last two weeks ago, a 13 year old girl in a village that I now just started working with with their cultural dances um, committed as well. So this is a really serious um, subject and uh, that's uh, affects everybody. It's uh, it has affected me as well. But looking beyond that, 
within our uh, our ways of doing, you know, we need to redevelop those safety nets that were in place within our culture. So that's all I have to say. Oyana, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your words, Asi. And they expressed, you know, my heart goes out to you for the for experiencing those losses. It's so important what, the work that we're doing here. And Melanie also express, expresses her sorrow for loss and families in the villages and thoughts and prayers go to you, Asi. Um, I'd like to, uh, to move to our next panelist. And this is a young man, um, our artist is Adrian Day. And Adrian is 13 years old. He's in the seventh grade. He's Ho-Chunk Lakota, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. He's from the Grand Traverse area in Michigan. And he does wonderful things with traditional beadworking. And I, I'm aware of him as being a talented powwow dancer and he sings. And he's also intergenerational. I call it intergenerational traditional artist because I'm acquainted with his great grandmother and grandfather, Judy and Buddy. Um, they do traditional art and regalia. His, his grandmother, Monica, does traditional art regalia and beadwork, quill work. And his mother, Alexa, and his father too, traditional art regalia, beadwork. They make beautiful things. Um, Adrian? I'd like to uh, turn it over to you. Bonjour, I'm Sandra Gizu, and I'm a Kaya's Makoto, and I'm a Chawa Town and Dojwa. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Adrian Day. Um, I just like to say I'm happy I'm surrounded with all these great artists, like my mom, my dad, you know, my, my all my grandparents. And um, if it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't be doing art. And I think it's really good that they they uh, taught me. But um, um, how the first question? Um, how how do art support the sense of connectedness and or interconnection? I believe that it connects us through our ancestors and remembering that they were doing the same artwork hundreds and hundreds of years before we did and it also connects us to our future generations and i hope that in the future generations that we will be remembered as uh, ancestors and they will they will carry on our culture like we did to our past ancestors and um also how can youth reintroduce um, traditional arts and crafts to youth today. And I believe, um, or I know that there is um, many good classes and some of them I'm in and some of them in the future I'd like to teach. Um, but there are many good classes for, for youth nowadays that um, can teach you very good life lessons from learning artwork and those life lessons can be um, very vital um, to uh, the future. And um, I know this because artwork has taken me all across Turtle Island and um, given me many good opportunities. And um, it's also fun, <laughs> so that's good. It's not just sitting there. It's it's fun to do it, fun to carry on, carry on our culture, and um, what, what mainstream symbol symbols in Native, Native American communities are there nowadays? And I believe that there are many, many of them. Like even just years ago, we were misrepresented through um, movies or books. But even even now, just a few years later, as it has changed vastly, and there are many very good uh, representations of natives nowadays, including um, movies like. Res Dogs, Prey, Killers of the Fire Moon, 
dark winds and Yellowstone. And even in sports, big sports like the NBA, um, the Phoenix Suns um, had a very, um, very good representation of their their tribes over there um, with their jerseys. They had um, inspired um, Native artwork on their jerseys, and they had um, beaded medallions that um, the players appreciated deeply. And also, three other teams did this um, Native, Native inspired um, jerseys, including the Toronto Raptor, Raptors, the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves, and my favorite team, the Milwaukee Bucks. And those are all um, good, good representations of Native culture and um, uh, Natives in mainstream media. That's all the answers I have for now. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Well, thank you very much, Adrian. And I really uh, wanted to. Uh... I like the uh, the the slide that's showing, you know, I mentioned your um, your background being the Ojibwe and Lakota and Ho Chunk, and it looks like the the beadwork that's featured in this bag shows a lot of your um, tribal background. This, this kind of seems like a blend. Do you want to make a comment on that? Oh yeah, um, you can see um, like on the first slides with my bag, the hat, and even this bag here, you can see on the border that I do a call the galaxy design. And um, this, this correlate, correlates with my ancestors and even what I was just saying that um, I, I did this probably when I was just starting out and called it the galaxy. And then we went to a museum and we got to go in the archives and seeing a bag from the 1800s around that time and it had the same border and I was so surprised and because that's the I thought I was the first one to do it and then it was cool seeing that hundreds and hundreds of years ago people did that and it was kind of connected me more, even more to my ancestors by doing that design. Very beautiful. And that's mentioned, Melanie mentioned, beautiful work, Adrian. Very nice. Right. Thank you very much, Adrian. I appreciate having our youth voice and so uh, such talent too at such a young age. Right. Appreciate you being here with us. All right. Okay. And we do have uh, another artist with us today. Um, Kellen, Kellen um, Trinnell, he's a visual artist. He's a performer, small business owner, and uh, alumnus of uh, Notre Dame, which isn't too far from me in Michigan. So um, he's a holistic wellness practitioner, born and raised in the Pacific Northwest. He's proudly representing both African, Black American, and Nimipu, Nez Pierce ancestry. Kellen embraces these multiple identities to empower their work in all its manifestations. So Kellen, he shares um, heart work. He mentions the artwork and heart work through uh, Trinell Original, a traditional art-based two-spirit LGBTQ plus and BIPOC owned small business. Kellen, let me turn it over to you. All right, Katsuyaya, thank you. Good day, everyone. Uh, Inla Leutze can ki Piyokin, I am grateful to be here in this virtual meeting here today. Uh, in Winnikissa, Kellen Trinnell. Uh, my name is Kellen Trinnell, legal name, my government name, Kellen Lewis. Uh, yeah, Trinnell, my middle name. And uh, if you ever look for any of my art online, you'll find it under Kellen Trinnell itself. In was Kalani Wat, Kaka Kepanawat, Ka Titwat I am a beadwork artist as well as a traditional nest purse weaver. I'm also a storyteller and I share my art through, uh, as Julie mentioned, 
uh, Trinell Original. That's uh, my online presence uh, where I'm able to house all of the different uh, types of artwork that I put out into the world and, and to share it in one certain place. And I really appreciate the discussion points that have been coming up. And one of the ones that really stri strikes me is the sense of connectedness or interconnection that comes through our artwork. And so in the first slide, you saw some pieces that I made that were in response to two of the Nez Perce treaties that were made with the US government, both in 1855 and 1863. Now it was a three part series. This is two of the parts that you see here. Uh, however, uh, through this project, I was able to study the history of both of the treaties, not only reading the actual treaty documents themselves, yet also doing deep dive research into the participants uh, that helped formed these different treaties. And as an artist, I was able to make a response to that. Now, what brings connectedness and interconnectedness in, in that is the emotional portion that I didn't understand was going to come in reading the treaties themselves, thinking about my actual ancestors who had to process through listening to this dense legal language in order to make steps for their future generations. And we're finding that still being a true facet that is occurring in our tribal communities today, specifically with uh, my tribe, the Nimipu and or the Nez Perce people. Uh, one of the main topics that we're discussing right now is the issue of blood quantum and enrollment within our tribe. Now we're moving through these really deep legal documents and trying to communicate through a language that isn't necessarily um, natural to us while also trying to sustain uh, beautiful natural practices for our future generations. So this art, uh, art piece that I was able to put, art pieces, excuse me, art collection, uh, responds to those treaties and is a marker of who we are today. The one on the left that says pay us, that comes off very, um, very like, oh, give us money, where really if you to zoom in on the, the caption of it, uh, when we're saying pay us, I'm saying pay us in lost languages, pay us in lives lost, pay us in land stolen, pay us in generations of trauma, uh, pay us in generations of healing. Uh, because I was asked to value my artwork for sale and uh, in response to those treaties, I was like, how could I when so much heartbreak uh, is associated with the expression of this? Yet the inter interconnectedness also comes through my acting. I get to perform in a show called According to Coyote. It was originally written by a Nez Perce playwright, John Kaufman. The play has been brought back to life by one of John Kaufman's nieces, Josephine Keefe. She directed the show. And in the show, I get to tell coyote, coyote stories, coyote being a trickster of many tribes uh, across the land. And we learn life lessons through the do's and don'ts of coyote. Now, this has been beautiful because it's brought a sense of children's theater to traditional storytelling where I sing, dance, and act while sharing these stories with audiences of many generations. It's been a blessing to have my grandparents, my aunts and uncles, my parents, my brothers and sisters, and my nieces and nephews, and even younger kids uh, in these audiences learning traditional stories and learning how it applies to our lives here today. And so then uh, as we move forward, thinking of some examples of indigenous art and symbols that are created today, the play is one. And this is also another way that I found to share uh, examples of indigenous art and symbols that are created today. Uh, as uh, Adrian was explaining, and thank you so much, Adrian, for talking about reaching into our past and being so um, uh, filled by our past. Uh, I also understand, as uh, Adrian mentioned, that we are the markers of a future past, if that makes sense. So what would I contribute right now today that in 100 years could be looked back at, at as a marker of today and in this time? So on the left, you see my younger sister, Gabriella. She's wearing some of my beadwork. Uh, the dress itself is from our grandmother. It's over 80 years old and I beaded the matching accessories to go along with it. I also beaded the entire horse regalia set or horse trappings that you see on the right. 
And this will now be a, a set, an heirloom for our family to pass on through the generations. My grandparents have done an amazing job providing a lot of this for us over the years. And now this is our contribution to the continuation of our family and to our tribal legacy. And finally, there are some images that I have here of some of the work that I do as a beadwork artist, as a weaver, as a stylist, as a fashion designer, where I'm mixing together contemporary clothing with traditional art pieces. You can see the woven hats, the uh, litzkau in Nest Purse language, Nimi Putimt. Uh, so these are hand woven by me. I'm also mixing materials. The hat on the right, it's not only hand woven, I also beadwork embroider the top of it. So some of that darker uh, design work that you see is beadwork on top of a woven cap. And all of the, the dresses and the beadwork accessories, the leggings worn on the gentlemen, the hat bands, uh, the tying of the feathers, these are all things that I did with my hands. And I bring this up because it um, is literally a creation of, of, of today, marking who we are as contemporary indigenous people for the future. And not only this, I also am working to highlight the members within our tribe who share the same ancestry as me, who are both Black and Nimipu, showing the grand diversity of our tribal people from uh, this very specific perspective. Uh, that's only a touch, and um, I want to make sure to leave time for others, and I thank you for allowing me to speak through that. Oh, thank you very much, Kellen. Just some beautiful work, and I really like the way that we tie in, and we see you tie in the um, ancestral, ancestral creativity and modern contemporary. So as it develops, as we as people grow, and develop and move into new areas. Uh, thank you so much. All right. You know, um, what we have to share now is a video. And this one is by an artist named Gijigat. Gijigat means um, it is day in Ojibwe or Anishinaabin when, and she's from Detroit. We're sharing her video. She's a cultural worker, storyteller, filmmaker, and photographer. Um, she talks about the connection to flow and creativity when creating beadwork. And I like this quote that she says, stories have the capacity to heal and educate as well as spark creativity, movement and change. So let's listen to um, the video by Gijiga. Boju, hello. Megizi Gijigat Kwe Indigenikas. My name is Gijigat. My friends call me Giji. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, or they, them. Boju, hello. Megizi Gijigat Kwe Indigenikas. My name is Gijigat. My friends call me Giji. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, or they, them, and I'm an artist and a cultural worker based in Wauwatunan or Detroit, and I am a story weaver of many sorts. It work holds in it all of those infinite teachings of creation, so you can get into a meditative state very easily, I think, because of the, the focus on a tiny bead just one moment at a time to get one bead on the needle and then the next and the next and like the sewing it it's not only the repetition but the the focus which brings me to like my breathing and just my being like when I am beating I can just be me I can just be free and be in the moment and it really just all of those similar to the drummer like the emotions anything that is not in flow or that is not in love and gratitude and interconnection with the cosmos and one another just kind of drifts out of the way with the process of the beadwork itself so amazing when you're like beating a shape or something like if you're beating a flower you're not focused on the goal of the flower like you just trust the process that it will be that we are all creative beings like we we are meant to create because we are a reflection of creator and we're all connected in this way so meditating helps bring us inside so we can realize our connection to the outside 
And I'm really into neuroscience. So I was learning about creativity and how emotions are a part of creativity. Like we cannot ever be purely happy or purely sad. There's usually this spectrum of emotion and that that helps us to be able to create. And in COVID right now, a lot of people are lonely and our brain has the default network, which is a part of social cognition and memories. When this is underactive, like when we're not getting a lot of social interaction, that part of the brain actually changes and it triggers imagination. So it like helps us get into this meditative state to be able to create and realize that we are connected to one another, even though maybe we're not physically interacting. And it allows us to vision and dream and create new things. And so I think the world of meditation and like our practices just really opens up a world of possibility for us to connect in other ways and to heal my relationship to the practices are growing deeper. Like at first it was just, oh, I'm beating and it helps me calm down. Like all the anxiety just ooh, calms down. But now it's getting to these layers of where everything I make is about connecting with other people. All of our stories and connections are like a web. And like when we have trauma, usually it's just something that is clouding that relationship, like a good, pure, connection with another relative um and it's like uh we just like work to clean those connections so as we connect more through our stories through our beating through our dancing it just it it cleans it all up it helps us heal What a nice video. You know, I really appreciate I was, so mesmer- I was so mesmerized by her voice and her words, Julie. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Wonderful. Very nice. And it's, uh, you know, connecting to healing practices through traditional art seems to be the uh, really strong theme. So um, that's our, our panel. I'd like to turn it over to Sarah as we move into our subject matter experts. Sarah. Thank you, Julie. So we have a great panel together here of um, museum professionals, leaders. We have Christina Burke, who served as a leading curator at the Philbrook Museum in Tulsa, Oklahoma. She has extensive experience studying traditional native arts and their contemporary expression. Christina has brought with her an amazing diverse collection of historical images that will kick off our panel here in just a moment. Coming to us from Phoenix, Arizona, we'll hear from the Heard Museum's Director of Community Engagement, Marcus Moninerkit, who hosts a year-round educational event, a bunch of them, and is well-connected community-wide down in Phoenix and across the nation. Representing the Mitchell Museum in Evanston, Illinois, is Executive Director Kim Viju. Ms. Viju has brought an artist, Negues White, with her to share a museum-sponsored community youth event also Marcus has brought a youth with him as well, a youth artist. So at this time, um, Mark, if you can move us forward, we'll turn the floor over to Christina Burke. Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really honored to be with you all here today. Um, As introduced, my name is Christina Burke. I'm a non-Indigenous curator of Native art. I've had the great good fortune to work at institutions like the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and the Heritage Center at Red Cloud Indian School on the Pine Ridge Reservation, and for more than 16 years at Philbrook Museum of Art here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, within the boundaries of Muscogee Creek Nation. And I'm really glad to share some images with you today, if we can go to the first slide, um, from the Philbrook Collection. And I wanted to share these um, with you all today because they are images by Indigenous painters of traditional health, healing, and wellness in their own communities. And there's a few things that you'll notice, kind of threads connecting all of these images. One is the diversity that you see in these native communities 
throughout Indian country. But the other thing that you'll see is these connections, um, intergenerational connections, interpersonal connections, like this particular piece by Harrison Begay, in which we see an elder instructing the youth on, um, on native traditions from Navajo Nation. And in the next image, we see a, a, a Pueblo point of view, a Pueblo worldview, not just of interconnections of generations, but of male and female. We see the sun and the moon. We see these deer dancers, but there's also corn and other plants. So we see really a, an entire worldview from the Pueblo perspective and thinking about those connections, not just relationships among us humans, but with the natural world and the spiritual world around us. In the next image, we see a single figure um, in this painting by Fred Beaver, uh, Seminole Muscogee Creek artist. And in all of our communities, we have these specialists, these knowledgeable folks who train to become healers. They're intercessors, they are helpers. Um, they provide intervention when we need help. And that in all of these images and in all of our communities, there are often times when we as individuals, as families, as communities face challenges, and that we really need to call on those knowledgeable folks to help us get through those difficult challenges, those difficult times. In the next image, um, again, one of the thing, one of the themes that we see throughout, including in this painting by Archie Black Owl, who was Southern Cheyenne. We see the entire community coming together in this Cheyenne Sundance. We see men and women, we see singers and dancers. We see the whole community coming together to address the issues of health and wellness in that particular community. As in the next image, this is a um, large scale mural by Woody Crumbo, the Potawatomi artist um, of a Native American church ceremony. This piece is called Burning of the Cedar. And in this image, we see the man who's standing to the left and he's, um, he's shaking cedar chips into the fire and the resulting smoke, that gray blue smoke that you see coming up from the fire is the vehicle which carries their prayers up to the heavens and to the great spirit. So we see a number of people coming together again to intercede on the behalf of individuals, of families and of the community as a whole. And in the next image, this one by Carl Sweezy, a Southern Arapaho artist. I just love this painting. I think it's so, um, it's so powerful of another Native American church ceremony, which is taking place at night. That's why the painting is so dark, but the artist, so that we can see what's happening, so that we can see who is participating. The artist had has painted a window into the teepee so that we can see all of the members of the community in their places around the teepee, circling around that altar, coming together to pray together, to again, intercede on behalf of individuals, families, and the community as a whole. In the next slide, we see a similar image, this one by Al Mamaday, the Kiowa artist and father of the author and Scott Mamaday, another Native American church scene. And again, we see people coming together um, in prayer um, for this particular image. In the next one, uh, by Terry Saul, a Choctaw artist, Choctaw Sick Dance. I chose this image because again, we're, um, we're addressing the reality that there are times um, when we as human beings experience challenges, sickness, um, injuries, and that we have to call on knowledgeable people to, to intercede on our behalf. And again, those challenging times are when we need to come together, different generations, men and women, families and communities coming together to address those challenging times. And in the next image, but it's not always about challenge, sometimes it is about the joy and, and sharing together, like in this image by Victor Pepion of Hand Game. And again, we see different generations, men and women and children, elders, coming together to enjoy each other's company. And that one of the challenges that we as human beings face is that feeling of isolation and of being alone. And one of the ways, powerful ways to address that is just by coming together as family and community. In the next image, 
We just have a couple of more, but this one by Cecil Murdoch, again, of a, of a healing ceremony. We have the patient who is lying on the ground, um, an intercessor and others who are coming together to sing and pray, pray for their health and wellness. And in the last image to share, and this one by Jimmy Toddy or Bishan Yaz, another Navajo artist. Um, again, we see folks coming together. Um, everybody has a, a particular role, a responsibility to play as we face these challenges as human beings, that there are times that we all need to connect with one another to get through those challenging times. So I just wanted to share a little bit of some traditional images by indigenous artists from across Turtle Island um, to set up for the next section. And again, I want to share my thanks for being asked to join this important discussion and particularly to those participants in the Native Connections Program, my thanks to you for the work that you do every day in your communities. Thank you, Mado. Wow, Christina, thank you so much. You, you have your wealth of information, good resource. You uh, brought up times of important connection, healing ceremonies, a feeling of isolation that we go through sometimes, uh, sickness, prayer, um, animals, uh, natural resources like cedar, fire and more and the family connection which is what we're trying to get back to the connection between us and the community that's wonderful all right next up we have marcus Menendrickit and shakota ray nez your the floor is yours marcus thank you um well here at the herd museum we have a program that is uh, created um, to kind of help. It, it, it was created to help uh, stem the tide of, of, of cultural art loss. And the, the real focus is a transference uh, of indigenous art knowledge, cultural art knowledge. And so we travel around to the different communities uh, with their request. We, we work closely with the community and give them kind of the, the power and the agency to create the programs uh, as they uh, see fit, as they would work best in their community, because we know every community isn't the same. And so we don't, we just try to be as thoughtful um, and giving them as much agency as possible. I do have a my colleague with me today, Shakota, uh, she goes by Ray, and she's been with me for a few years and and uh, creating these programs. We travel around, and I thought maybe she would uh, just give a few words on the uh, the connectedness that it brings. Um, hi, my name is Shakota Ray Niz. I just a brief introduction. I am currently studying at ASU, uh, Arizona State University. I'm studying um, human systems engineering, which I, um, especially after you know doing um, these workshops and just learning more about reconnecting um, urban natives, but are also just natives who um, aren't given the same opportunities to learn their cultural art forms. I've learned that I really want to. Um, move forward in uh, like community building for my career and just learning more about how to indigenize education for um, Native youth. But um, yeah, I've been with the herd when doing these workshops for the past two years, I would say. And um, one of my personal favorite um, workshops we did was um, in Tucson, Arizona, which is where I'm from, even though I'm Dene, I grew up in Tucson. Um, but specifically, like if anyone knows the TO res here, it's the Garcia trip I, strip. I grew up right next to their um, their res. But anyways, I um, yeah, we had a workshop called the Song and Drum Workshop where we brought in um, a uh, his name was Samson. Sinqua, and he was a uh, hoop dancer. Um, he won, I believe, the two years ago, the world championship. So um, we brought him and his family down and invited a bunch of people. And I personally invited my uh, three siblings to come and work with me or work, you know, in the workshop. And it was just really, you know, um, 
great to just, you know, experience that, share what I've been doing in the past few years with my own family, but also taking it back down to Tucson. And like, that's, you know, where I do um, identify as my own like home. Like it's where I grew up. It's where, you know, I learned so many things. So um, yeah, personally, that one was one of like the most fulfilling ones I've done. Um, I participated in, but I know um, a lot of people can get, you know, everyone we we help they can get a lot of out a lot out of the workshops especially there's um this one family that we work with sometimes in particular they come to our a lot of our workshops and we do you know beading weaving and um uh, a bunch of other ones and so this family we have come in she they um they recently started to make their own regalia and it was because we had these workshops um and we they were able to, you know, slowly stitch pieces together, like with the beading or with weaving or with moccasin making, like they were able to like slowly start to um, really just reconnect. And um, I think that's, you know, at the, at the end of the day, the goal that we have with our workshops. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. <clears throat> Great. And I have just really been, it's really been a privilege to travel around and, and be a part of this. Um, in the communities. We think also that one of the most important aspects of the, the arts in the communities is really like identity building. A lot of times we get contrary information, contradictive information about our value in in the world. And uh, I think, you know, working through the arts, uh, you, you find that it's 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 very relevant and, and uh, we certainly have that place. We brought a couple of uh, uh, videos to share uh, they do talk about like the participants um, challenges and uh, this is actually a, a, a recent youth moccasin making workshop we did in Bilas, Arizona, San Carlos Apache Reservation um, and it was during spring break so it just happened in March it was a one week intensive and they come together to uh, make a pair of moccasins uh, to really uh, key, you know, and, and um, a strong kind of connector. And the teachers there on the left, and there were 15 or so students. It was very successful, and everybody created a pair of moccasins. But we also create films along with these, as we find that it's a, a powerful way of sharing that and amplifying the importance of, 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 of this type of practice. So if, I, if we can, we can go right to the, to the film this one here. This basket class to me, it's um, important on, I guess, um, several different levels. One, of course, is my family. Um, this is one um, craft I really don't know how to do or I've seen. And so this was, a, I seen a, the class and it came to me right as a, like at a good time. My great grandmother was Chiricahua, but her skills weren't passed down. So um, it's nice to be able to reconnect with that part of, of a culture that was lost to me, to my family. The purpose of our bas basket weaving in the old times was to, you know, uh, gather the food because we're known as uh, hunters and uh, gatherers. You know, in the older times, it was, you know, basically for the food gathering and in order to, you know, pick up all the cactus plants and all the things that, you know, we have to go through so the basket weaving is important. It's, it's really died out as, as the problem. And I wanted to learn how to do the, the burden baskets because that's one of our main uh, baskets that they used to gather because they used it for gathering bigger, bigger things. My great grandmother um, left the US and, and married a Mexican man um, she didn't pass the culture down, and it was lost to my branch of the family. So that um, 
for me, it's personal because I'm getting, like I said, I'm getting that little bit back. Um, and to think that that could happen so many times over is frightening. That this, these, I should not say these because it's not just this basket. Um, that these types of things that our ancestors relied on to survive could just be lost. Nowadays, um, I've noticed there's a big demand for um, traditional stuff like this. Like, there's always somebody asking, um, I need somebody to make a cradle board for me. I need somebody to make a basket for me. I need somebody to make a tea necklace for me. You know, it's really something that's um, <sighs> kind of dying out. So it's nice that we have workshops like this to help um, pass on that um, knowledge and hopefully <laughs> keep it around forever. The material, filling it in raw form like this, it's making you be patient. It is asking you to slow down, like putting a model car together. Everything's already fixed and all you have to do is read the instructions and, you know, tack on A, B, C, D. But here, there's no instructions that I can refer to. It's more trial and error and it's more you have to do the process and really ex, um, just sit there and see how things are going to come out. And it's, you just can't, <laughs> there's not going to be an instruction book for every basket you make. And that's, I guess that's the reality of it. <laughs> In Arizona specifically, a lot of different tribes use like yucca and they do kind of like the coil baskets where it's just like um, pretty fast, I guess you could say to complete. Um, this is totally different. This is actually using the resources um, in the, I guess, um, in the area. So a lot of willow, um, the sumac branches, uh, stuff that's grown in higher elevation. You see traditional uh, plants and um, just different things that are out there and you really don't know. You pass by them every day, but you don't um, take notice, you know, until you, I mean, I guess until you really learn what they are. And so that's when things like I'm going to be looking out for. <laughs> hmm, that looks like a really good branch I could use, you know. Or... I was surprised at how very little tools we needed to, um, to do this. A lot of it was um, stripping um, bark and, um, you know, the branches with your bare hands, you know, using your knees, using um, your fingers, you know. Um, I thought it'd be like being able to use certain tools to be able to scrape out a lot of that stuff. But no, I was really surprised at how it was very hands-on. Um, when you start, there's, there's the willow stick, which is thicker and you make your slit and then you, you were trying to separate it in half and there's balance. So if it starts to go too much one way, then you have to push the other way. And if you're not, feeling it and paying attention, if you just want it to, to hurry and do it the way you want it to, it's going to strip. It's, you're going to lose the stick um, because it's already got its grain in there and you have to just follow what it wants to do. You can guide it, but you can't make it do something it doesn't want to do. It's my, my first basket. Um didn't quite know what it would take to um, put it together, I guess. And the patience of um, making myself pay attention to little details, because at first when I was, you know, pulling the, the, the willows apart, I was just, and it would split, like not even three fourths of the way down. And so making myself disciplined to learn the process, because I think that's a lot of times you just, oh, just let's do it and get it done kind of thing. But it was like, okay, no, you can't. You have to listen to the instructor. You have to watch what she's doing and then yourself have to, you know, do exactly what she's, she's, she's doing it as best she can to explain to you how to do it and learn from her experience. I know by doing that same method here, by looking and listening real close, and I know I paid attention and, and yet, you know, I still don't have the feeling. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's by splitting and cleaning the stems, 
I'm catching it now, so and being here yesterday and today, it's, it's helped a lot, so I like it. I liked it. It's going to benefit me and my tribe. Well, the basket I started off with, I had to add some more of the uh, willow, so that's why that's sticking out, but it's starting to shape to look like a basket. Um, I don't think we're going to get very too far today, but um, the hardest part was definitely starting it. Um, and after you get the hang of weaving it, I think I'd be able to finish on my own. To tell you the truth, whenever I did it from yesterday and my fingers were really sore and I didn't really, I guess, anticipate that feeling of being my hands being sore because I haven't had that feeling in a really long time. And um, the smell, yeah, of the sumac and the willow combined, it just makes you think about a lot of different, um, I guess, like calming, a calming smell. And that's how I think I'm going to associate now the, the sumac and the willow. Making the thread, just this part, took me back to beginning weaving. <laughs> and um, that feeling of, you know, am I ever going to get it? And in my mind, I know, okay, if I keep practicing, eventually I'll get to the point where I don't have to think about it and my fingers will just know what to do. And right now my mind is trying to tell me what to do and that's what's messing me up because I'm not really letting the plant do what it needs to do. I'm trying to make it do what I want it to do and that's, um, I end up stripping it down to the bark and then I have to just start all over again. Um, so that was totally new. I am a substance abuse um, preventionist. And so I do a lot of different things in the community and um, tying things back to culture and tradition is a really strong, uh, you know, a resiliency um, skill that I'd like to teach other kids. And um, now that I know so many people in my community that have taken this class, it would be really good to have them as a resource. And the more connections you have to your culture and to traditions, it's a great strength and you know, resiliency skill for, for kids and youth. I'm always reminded that even though um, we can be separated by so many, you know, thousand miles, there are some things that are just the same. You know, it doesn't matter what tribe you're from, some things are the same. Different materials, different uses maybe, but still the same. And so things are entirely different, you know, because the materials are different, some things have to be, but um, like splitting the sticks, it's the same thing you would do with, with um, Jankas or Thule in California. Before it was actually a necessity for the Apache people to have, you know, to be able to carry things while they work and gather for wood, gather for food. Um, everyone, um, basically needed one and now today you know you see them a lot in ceremonies you see them a lot in home decoration to kind of I guess identify yourself as you know this is an Apache basket I'm Apache and it's really important because Apache people are known for baskets you know no I'm just very thankful that the herd Museum was able to bring us to us you know and I'm very thankful that um, I am such a true believer and things happen for a reason um, when um, something is put forth for you, it'll either work out um, for a reason or doesn't work out for a reason, you know, things like that. And um, I think this is was brought to, to me for a reason. So I'm going to take that blessing and I thank the Creator for that and the people who, who were able to put this type of stuff together. While that rolls continues, I just want to touch on a couple of key points here, why we do these things. A lot of times I get asked, um, 
different community members, people from my own family, like, why do you still do this cultural arts? You know, what? why aren't you doing like computer science or something, you know, which is valid. Uh, but there are a couple of different sides to life, one being the instrumental, the other being the expressive. And the arts bring us the expressive. They show us, a, they show us lessons about patience, which was mentioned. Patience, attention to detail, discipline, order, ritual. Those are all necessary things for us. And the arts help us uh, keep this alive. So that's why we do it. And uh, it's time-tested principles, you know, for community and, and individuals. So they're holistic and uh, they are pretty much universal. You know, if you maintain a responsibility, respectfulness, your relations and reciprocity, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll go far. We do have one more piece because it was mentioned earlier uh, about sport and uh, dance is in, really important for us here at the Herd Museum. We've run this program for uh, over 30 years, uh, but active lifestyles is, is, is just as important as anything else. Uh, we do believe that dance, of course, is art. Sport is art. They're human expressions. And uh, so we can roll through this and just give you a little taste of, of uh, the hoop dance ceremony and its importance. Uh, this is Eric Manielito here at the 30th Annual World Championship Hoop Dance Contest here at the Herd Museum in Phoenix, Arizona. We want to welcome you once again uh, joining us and all that you'll take in this year with the singing and the dancing. We're glad that you're going to experience that with us and uh, hope that you enjoy everything that you see. Thank you. Good morning, my name is David Roach. I'm the Dickey Family Director and CEO of the Herb Museum, and I welcome all of you to the 30th Annual World Championship Hoop Dance Competition. We hope you'll come down and join us for some spectacular dancing, there's incredible music, food, and of course the museum is open to everyone. Lots of great exhibitions to see. So come on down. Good morning. We have an amazing audience. The fan base has grown every year and we've got some uh, people anxious to see 97 hoop dancers. It's good to be here and this is Dennis Bowen. I'm from the Seneca Nation, from the Allegheny Seneca Territory in upstate New York. Hello, my name is Tony Duncan. I'm representing here Mojo Media. My name is uh uh, Rick, our name is Nick Skada of Yellowbird Dancing. We represent the San Carlos Apache Nation as well as the Rikra, Kadatsa, Mandan peoples. And we're here today sharing some of our stories through hoop dancing. Hoop dancing is that storytelling, old traditional way of telling a story through the hoop, gradually adding more hoops one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to even sometimes 50 hoops. Um, it's a dance that they say originates from the Taos Pueblo people from New Mexico. Um, I have a wide variety of hoop dancing within my family, um, my wife, my four children, hoop dance, um, as well as my brother Kevin, my brother Talon, hoop dance this year. Um, I also have a brother Carl, brother Ken Jr. that also shares within hoop dancing, and my nephews RJ, Tiza, they also are hoop dancers as well. Um, all of us were taught by my father, so it's a family affair, it's been passed down from each generation, and um, it's a dance that celebrates all of life and honoring all living beings. And my favorite thing to do, hoop dance. Hey, thanks a lot for joining us this year at the 30th Annual World Championship Hoop Dance Contest here in Phoenix, Arizona at the Herd Museum. We're hoping that you'll plan to be here again with us next year as we go into the 31st year. And uh, looking forward to seeing who all new dancers and new singers and what all we look forward to in the beginning of uh, our new decade that we face. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day. Thanks.
So that was our, our hoop dance. It was created by Mojo Media. It was an outside uh, firm that shows up, um, you know, and it has a, a strong presence in the, in the area each year, 30 plus years of, uh, of an event. But it's, you can see that it's very intergenerational and uh, just very community driven. So I do thank you all for listening to, to me. Uh, and um, thank you, Rez, for joining me. Uh, Ray, <laughs> Rez. Thank you, Ray Nez, for joining me. I, uh, any, any last departing words? No, I think you said it all. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ray. Uh, thank you all. That's Thank it. you, Marcus and Ray. That was wonderful. You guys talked about the power of experiential learning with basket weaving. Connecting to ancestral knowledge is a strength and resiliency was important. A feeling of calm was really wonderful when we listened to the Apache Burden Basket video. Lessons of patience and holistic healing. I think that each one of those hoops, so when they're doing the, the hoop dance, represents a person that they want, they're hoping will get healed. So next up, um, if we can go to the next slide, we're kind of getting to the end of our panel. Here we have Ms. Kim Vijou from the Mitchell Museum and Kim has brought a guest with her. Kim, the floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kim Vijou. I am uh, a citizen of the Oneida Nation and descendant of the Menominee tribe in Wisconsin. I grew up in Green Bay, um, right near our reservation, and have spent about the last 20 years working in DC with the Bureau of Education and the Substance Abuse and Health Services Administration on a number of health and education issues, particularly with um, Native youth. Um, and I joined the Mitchell Museum of the American Indian in October 2021. Um, my background is a little bit different than people who uh, lead museums. I um, have a background in anthropology and public health, um, but have spent the entirety of my career working with um, Native people and especially Native youth on various issues. And a huge part of that in behavioral health was focusing on healing, and much of that was done um, with the incorporation of culture and the arts. So I tried to bring that into my work at the museum and really look at um, first as an organization, how we can do better in working with native people and in, in our own community. So we are in Evanston, Illinois, which is about, it's the surrounds um, Chicago and um, Chicago happens to have one of the largest native communities in the country and this, you know, large and diverse thriving native community. So we just had all these great resources at our disposal and, and, and in our backyard. And so it was um, a really great time to, you know, build these bridges and start these collaborations. Um, so Starting in 2022, we, we partnered with the St. Kateri Youth Center, um, which is also another native organization located in the city. So um, you'll see here we have um, pieces of a mural. Um, over the course of the summer, we worked with the native youth on developing this mural. And I'll let Nick West, um, who facilitated the process, talk a little bit more about this. Um, but this was the first step in our work with the Native community and particularly the Native youth in the area. Um, so we've done a number of things that we've started. So the mural was the first step. We also hosted um, a Native youth, or um, excuse me, a Youth and Family Day. And so the Native youth were also part of that process in creating um, crafts and doing art demonstrations. And that's really great for this area so that the, the uh, our visitors and the public get to know native people and see them and then interact with them um, in an in-person basis um, as a museum in an area that doesn't have any like, reservation or federal Indian lands. 
uh, we like almost on a weekly basis have someone or a school group come in with the assumption that Native people no longer exist anymore. So um, working on the arts together is a really great way to humanize Native people and um, to kind of erase all of these misunderstandings that um, the public has about Native people and Native youth. Um, and so understanding that this work is, um, it's not only healing for Native youth, it helps them, you know, preserve and maintain their culture. Um, it connects the Native youth with their elders in the area. Uh, Chicago is a very big city and everyone, uh, the Native community used to be really concentrated in one area and now everyone's sort of dispersed. So these events and, you know, coordinated activities are a really great way to bring people together and pass on this like intergenerational exchange. And then it bridges the cultural connections between the Native and non-Native community um, and really kind of changes the way that people perceive, perceive Native youth. Um, so our work has expanded since um, we you know, started this PowerPoint and this project. Um, so we had the family day, we're continuing that. And then we have this youth mural that um, Nick West will share more about. And I'm really excited about this, our collaboration with the Secretary Circle and Chicago Public Schools has, um, has really grown and we will be uh, debuting a Native youth exhibit um, kind of created and developed um, entirely by the Native youth and Nick West is a big part of that. So I'll also let him share more about that as well. So, um, I'll have Nick West talk about that. Nick West is the youth coordinator at the St. Terry Youth Center and um, is, he's Ojibwe and Diné, and he's also an accomplished artist and just really all around beloved by all the, the kids. So, Nick West? Ujuani, Nick West, and Disney Kaz, Chicago Dujaba, Masikin, and Dudem. I'm Nick West. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. I was actually born in Evanston, which is weird because, you know, I represent Chicago pretty hard. Um, I'm Turtle Clan from Wapai in Canada. My grandfather's actually from Fort Defiance, so I wanted to talk to my native buddy from there. I was like, hey. Um, I grew up in Chicago as a pretty much just one of the kids that just lived at the American Indian Center. And it was like a home away from home. Like if you needed a snack, you go to the center and go raid the fridge, you know? So like growing up in any community is like a big, very much surrounded by artists, very much surrounded by stories, very much surrounded by my culture. And I was listening to Ray when she was talking about being a uh, urban native. And recently I felt very disconnected. I, we did a research project with the Northwestern about identity. And in a lot of my researchers, when they interviewed me and a lot of the kids, the kids that grew up in Chicago felt, we didn't feel like we were Indian enough, or we didn't feel like we practiced our traditions enough, or spoke our language enough. We didn't feel like we were as Indian as the res Indians, you know? Found out that a lot more natives live in the city than they do in the res. And a lot more, um, my aunt brought to my attention that a lot more urban families practice their culture. So my grandma was a basket ma maker, well-known fiber maker, uh, spoke her language fluently, uh, made quilt blankets, had a puppet ministry, um, ran classes, did community events, took care of the elders, ran the social services, wore all these multiple hats. And to me, that was his grandma. I mean, that was like, and then my mom took over and kind of like took over the, the servant leadership role. And these traditions were passed um, I didn't have a father, so my uncle stepped in as that male figure role. My grandfather stepped in as that role, vice versa for my cousins. You know, that some of them didn't have mothers. So my aunt, my mom became their mom and realizing we were, my aunt brought to my attention that we were practicing traditional values in the city, that we were just as much culturally sound as people that were from the reservation. And that blew my mind, you know what I mean? I was like, oh my God, literally. I was that was go to you know spirit from reservation dogs instantly and that inspired me to continue my path and working with children so learning my traditional stories like my Ojibwe creation story right um I talked to a lot of people in Chicago as we grow up the students felt invisible did not feel 
I would ask them what tribe they were. Half these kids did not know their tribes, did not know how to introduce themselves. By the end of the week, they knew their tribe, their clan, how to, their language. They were introducing themselves. Like it was amazing. They the process of this mural happening was the idea was to show the area that the natives there are still there. And so how best to represent yourself through then, you know, your spirituality, your 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 origin stories, like they said in the beginning, our traditional values. And so we were talking, I was talking to the kids and I was like, do any of you guys know the creation story? And some of them did, some of them didn't, you know, and some of them knew parts of it. And so I was telling them the story and a lot of kids loved it. They're blown away. They're like, it was like some of their first time hearing it. And they're like, let's do that. Let's do that. And that was kind of what I wanted to try to push them towards. Like, let's do a traditional story. Let's tell our traditional stories. And they jumped on it right away. I didn't even, I just baited them a little bit. And then they brought up another story they learned about the day eagle, about how we got night and day how skunk used to be white and how skunk got its stripes, how skunk was turned black, how we got sweet grass, all these stories that start pouring out of these kids that were teaching me, the adult, the expert. And man, was I blown away. And it's hard to be like, I'm an artist. So it was hard for me to more be the coach than the player. Like I wanted to shoot the ball. I wanted to do all the Kobe, you know, but I had to let the kids play and I had to be the coach. That was a new position you had for me. And just to see them like from going from, you know, a lot of these children had mental anxieties and they had like social anxieties that I was kind of aware of, but didn't realize how severe they were. Their parents were like, I don't know what you did. Something happened, you flipped the switch. My kid cannot wait to go hang out with their friends. And they were one of those kids that have stayed in a room and drew all day, did not want to go out. And now they're like, I can't wait to do the mural, mom, can we go? Like waking up early getting like, and I was like, wow, they're like, I don't know what you're doing, but. I was like, I'm giving them creative control. And they're like, what does that mean? I'm like, I'm letting them drive the ship. I'm just kind of like, hey, you know, don't hit that iceberg over there. Let's not Titanic this mug. But they're in control and they know it and they're loving it and they're embracing it. And I'm embracing their ideals. Um, we hit a little Pokemon rabbit in there. Um, we did all kinds of funny stuff. They put jellyfish, you know, this kid kid stuff. But we told the Ojibwe creation story. We told we told the day eagle story about the uh, was it skunk knots. They uh, did tribal moons. They were, man, it was probably the best experience of my life. I'm so thankful for like Kim and them to like, just to see something special in me to like help me use my talents and gifts to like pay it for, you know, to help the community heal, help me heal, help the children heal. And so I just see this as continuing into something like level two now. So now we're working on another mural, Water's Life or the Indian housing uh, program that is being developed in Chicago for like low income or people that need help, they're building housing. So we're helping them. And so Kim and the Mitchell Museum, we all decided to partner together to continue this creative flow, this synergy. And they gave us the third floor to the Mitchell Museum. So some of these kids are like, wait, what? I'm going to be in a museum? Like, yes. Like, they're just like, and so we've been having every week. We've been having art classes and just like pretty much like art therapy, just kids coming together and just being able to let loose and express themselves and do what they love with other kids and laugh and giggle and have pizza, you know, and fight over pepperoni and like, it's hilarious. And so now that we have this opportunity to do, like to use this space, so I see it as a blank canvas, right? So now the, the specialness is like, what are we gonna focus on? What are we gonna tell? What's What, what magic is gonna appear on the walls? Uh, we we're talking about traditional stories and identity. And I feel like someone brought up how did their family get to Chicago? And so I remember learning a ton about Kim and how her family came to Chicago. And then the kids, we just started sharing all our family stories. And it was such a beautiful thing. Like a lot of kids understood like relocation and uh, boarding school and how that affected their And a lot of them didn't know what it was until other kids talked about it. And they're like, hey, that happened to my grandma. That happened to me. That happened. How, how did you get here from North Dakota? How did you get here from Alaska? How did you get here from Chicago? I mean, from Canada, you know, and it was this, this beautiful exchange. So I think I'll end with this is our, our next focus is to tell the stories from these kids' perspective of how my grandma got to Chicago or how my grandparents met in Chicago and how we just kind of like, you know, we're still, we're thriving now. And that's how I want the children to see it is we're not no longer in survival mode. We're voicing and I'm giving them that microphone and I could tell they're like, they, they're all fighting for the microphone now. And so I think Kim and 
Dimitri Museum, I thank you guys very much for helping us, and I can't wait to see what happens and what's next. Uh -huh. Well, my goodness, my goodness, Kim and Nicholas, that was wonderful. You, you reminded us that art connects us. It helps to preserve and maintain cultural identity. It bridges native and non-native communities. If you're an urban Indian, the arts can, can connect you, can ground you in traditional values. Murals, moons, skunks, so much stuff going on there with the murals there in Nicholas. <laughs> you know, Julie, I think we need another 90 minutes. We were just getting warmed up. This has been really, really good and, 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 and entertaining and engrossing and I appreciate it. Oh, by the way, did you know that uh, skunk, have you heard that, that Chicago might, might be coming from the word Chicago yeah. for skunk? Yeah, and so you mentioned skunk and I was thinking about that too. Oh, yeah. Mystery solved, mystery solved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great, well, thank you so much for that. It's just, uh, Wonderful. And then Melanie put in the, in the comments here, culture is prevention, because it really was uh, moving to me to hear the stories of how um, creativity and art brought youth into another, um, another dimension of their being of, of uh, health and wellness. So, yes. And um, I'd like to, uh, to move now into just seeing, you know, we've had the opportunity to um, to uh, listen to our fabulous artist panel and our uh, museum folks. Um, we've got a few moments for questions. So if there's something you haven't had the, the chance to ask, um, and uh, if you have a question that we can, uh, we can share here. Uh, like well, while, to... while they're thinking about that, Julie, you know, it makes me think that I wonder how we can spark more interest among our Native Connections grantees in getting involved, getting the arts involved in programming. Maybe that's something we need to move into into the future. Oh, excellent point, Sarah. Getting more arts into our Native Connections programs because we can see and we've heard stories of how this has really made a difference because, uh, you know, yes, culture is prevention and it gives us the opportunity to see it in action here. Um, so. Anybody have any questions that they haven't had the opportunity or something that sparked your interest or you thought of? Um, I have a question, Julie. All right, thanks, Barbara. Go right ahead. Yes, I have a question for Kellen. And uh, my question was, because I know um, I really appreciate all of the work that he does, but I also follow him on social media. And um, I know that when I first started following him, he did this wonderful, beadwork um of Beyonce and um and I think he raffled it off or something but um but it was beautiful and I know in doing digital stories sometimes when I've been working with youth and uh, I can think of one young man in particular who was an artist and he said but people are expecting me to be an Indian artist you know, and he had this, um, you know, he almost was confrontive in, 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 uh, in talking to me about this. He was, uh, you know, and he said, can I talk about my art? And I said, yeah, I said, it's your story. Tell your story. And he really did, um, I guess, a uh, story kind of horrors, horror art. And that's what, what he was did. That was his thing. And I said, do whatever you want, you know, that's your story. But um, but I've heard that before by other uh, people, young men saying, oh, but they expect me to be do native art. And um, I know that uh, Kellen does all kinds of things. And um, I'm just wondering uh, if if sometimes he is uh, kind of being put into that container or how he, how he would talk to other um, native artists who sometimes feel like they're putting into a putting in a container. Wow, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, I, I grabbed a, one of my stickers really quick to kind of show as a visual. I don't know if it'll come across, but you can That's kind it. of see an image of uh, Beyonce there. Uh, it's kind of hard to do with this Zoom Zoom world that we live in. Yet, uh, basically, it's taking an image of uh, one of the music videos that Beyonce did, and she was wearing all of this ornate jewelry. And I thought, oh my gosh, what if I was able to put all of my jewelry on her to bead her hat completely as we see beaded hats made and matching earrings set with big choker and big medallions and 
big cuff bracelets uh, and you know that's still on my my life's vision board yet in the meantime I was like well let me just do it as an art piece uh, and then that art piece has ramped up into so many other expressions and really to get to the heart of the question yes I mean we are the storytellers of today and uh, we are internet connected we are uh, living in, in a world where uh, we have so many ideas and so many other cultures around us, whether it's uh, an affinity for horror films or for musicals, whatever it may be, uh, sci-fi, anime. And so our expression in this is just as valid. And one thing that my aunt always likes to share is that in working with youth and the education programs uh, down on the Nez Perce Reservation is that oftentimes we feel as though we have to look deep into our past to find indigenous knowledge when really we are the knowledge bearers of tomorrow. And so encouraging all of us to, to basically to, to understand our own worth and to put that forward. And so as that goes with art, uh, really just encouraging uh, our artists and creators in, in all shapes and forms, whether they're writers or performers or even readers, you know, taking in art uh, to really uh, feel feel empowered and secure to express it in the many ways and like we even saw in that mural they they added a pokemon into the creation story you know that's marking who we are right here right now for future generations uh, so yes thank you for that question and uh, there's so much more to go into that uh, yet yeah, it's such a great topic so thank you Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Colin. I appreciate you sharing. And I appreciate everybody hanging in there. We're a little bit past our, our 90 minute time, but it's just been so much good information and things that have been shared and the experiences. But I wanted to um, just to uh, wrap things up and say thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you enjoyed our discussion on art, on healing, on youth, community wellness. And I hope that it inspires you to bring art to our youth programming so that we can share in that healing and gaining well-being. So thank you very much. And I appreciate you being with us today. And I hope that uh, you have the opportunity to get some uh, some information, some in something inspired here. And it looks like Tina Jackson shared something in the chat too, an image. So, all right. Thank you for joining us. And I look forward to uh, seeing you on another webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Mappy Kuabman.